is our closing moment where we introduce our guest analyst here who will give her perspective and dig in deep and make sense of what you've had so far. Dr. Constance Ikoko is my guest. Good to see you and thanks for your time. Good to see you too. You had uh, Ambassador Ojako. He raised uh, quite a number of questions that uh, are not uh, rhetorical, but they need answers, especially from African leaders. You had spoken to us about the need for African leaders to actually uh, make such an audacious move. And uh, for someone who's uh, worked with them at that level saying the same thing, what are we not getting right or what are the leaders missing out? His analysis was fantastic, both the, the first guest and the second guest. And then the second guest speaking to this talked about different channels, people talking at each other and not talking to one another. I, I think that's a missing point there. There's also something that our so-called leaders might not be telling us. You know, what mm -hmm. is this about? You know, I mean, at this point, everyone is looking at ECOWAS the citizens of these uh, countries, 15 countries in the sub-region, are looking at their so-called leaders and watching to see what move they will make. Why? Because whatever uh, um, steps they take in the coming days will either de-escalate the situation or pour gasoline on it. And the question will also be asked, in whose interest, like Ambassador Ojako said, in whose interest will you be acting in the long term? Would that be in the interest of the region, the sub-region, or is that in the interest of somebody else? Um, so um, as it stands, the military junta um, is ready to risk it all. We can see that. They're ready to risk it all. While there is this subsisting demand that President Basum be reinstated, they are like, it's not going to happen. In situations such as this, there's usually the talk of, okay, let's agree on a, a time frame of restoring democracy, conducting elections, and all the old players will not be involved in these elections. I think this might be an agreeable point, both, both for ECOWAS and the military junta, but they have to get there. I'm also happy you talked about um, the back channels, uh, yeah. like uh, former CBN Gover Governor Sam Sanusi Lamido, who was able to meet uh, the officials, the military officials in Niger. It tells you that um, there's much that we as, Af as Africans can do without even the help of outsiders. There are certain things that we can do. There is um, a cultural and religious affinity working there. These are all the same countries. When you remove the colonial borders, these countries are the same. I mean, uh, we have seven states that border Niger Republic. In some of those states, there is no actual border. You can cross over. People come to Nigeria for school and return to Niger to continue their lives. So this is what it is. These are brothers and sisters. And so we might have to continue to explore those, explore those back channels yeah. in order to find a peaceful solution. And again, speaking of this, uh, which uh, I, I want to stay on the back channel because uh, Ambassador Ojeko said specifically that we must uh, exhaust every uh, opportunity, every avenue. And Gabby also highlighted the need for the president to start, as a matter of advice, start looking at uh, the first things to be done to allow for mediation. He wants uh, perhaps the sanction on or electricity cut uh, to be revisited. Um, I, I quite agree with him. I don't know why, well, okay, so the argument is that you have to impose sanctions. Those are standard Western playbook. Impose sanctions, cripple them so that they come back begging. These ones don't look like the ones that are going to come back. They are preparing and gearing up for war. Um, so it's the citizens of Niger that are actually suffering this. But when you look at the turnout in the stadiums all over the country, you are shocked what is going on. It looks like those people are quite popular, I at mean, least you, at you, this you, moment. You can see the numbers. With, with, yeah, at least this moment with the military junta because there is a fight that is going on. One thing I have to say, though, is that when I was watching the ECOWAS Extraordinary Meeting today, it was full of 90%, if not 99.9% .9 men. The women were non-existent in that room. And I think this is important. Why is it? Because um, women and men have different forms of leadership or leadership styles. Um, empirical research as or by carried out by the Africans uh, uh, has it that women usually 
um, see leadership as facilitating, while men see as leading. And then women might have more empathy and you know, engage in more negotiation, mediation, in order to arrive at a point that is agreeable to everybody. So that room was you know, looking so barren without women. It is time for us to begin to open up the space for more women to come into leadership in African countries. It will actually do us a little good, or a, a lot of good, because you don't want to be in a room where the men are gearing up for war. There's hyper-masculinity, which hasn't worked for us at all all over the African continent. You need a dose of that female leadership, uh, female touch, which I think will be useful for us. This is a time to begin to look in that direction. I, and, I think we should. and quickly, let's see if we can close on looking at the US uh, interest in this and that of France. Uh, perhaps uh, they, by now they should be able to gauge what Africans are saying, whether from Anglo-Africans or Franco-Africans countries. Uh, what do you think should be the next step, knowing full well that there seems to be an overwhelming uh, you know, agitation for true independence for French Africans? There is a report that the U.S. had a delegation today you know, for the ECOWAS meeting. I mean, they have been in this continent for centuries, and people are not saying completely leave the continent. People are just saying that centuries of working with you, of partnership with you, has been very terrible for African countries. So can we renegotiate this partnership and this friendship in a way that we decide what happens majorly? Because in your countries, you know, that's what you know, transpires. We don't make the decisions for you. And so I think there are hearing, they are hearing, but it's difficult for them to cut loose and go. And that's why you ask the question again, what is so special about Niger? Why is everybody down on Niger trying to break down their neck? It happened in other countries. Why are they holding on to Niger? It looks like the last bastion of post in the West African sub-region. Um, so, but at the end of the day, like um, Ambassador Ojiako had said, in whose interest is all of this going to be? If we go to war, you know, if we do go to war, what are the consequences? It's going to be tragic for West Africa and Africa as a whole. You know, there is the massive displacement of people. There is the refugee situation. There is the destruction of infrastructure. We don't even have infrastructure already. We are challenged in that area. And you want to destroy the ones that you have already. I mean, there will be families broken in communities, you know, broken from one another. You don't want to see that. So you have to paint the scenario ahead of time. If we do this, what is it going to be? What will be the effect and impact on our countries? When you look at the, the border regions, the sanctions on Niger is already affecting the border regions with Nigeria. So this is also going to be Nigeria fighting Nigerians. We have to think very sensitively on these matters before ECOWAS concludes on whatever um, steps they are taking in the coming. It's, it's an unfolding story, so we'll be watching to see. And think deeply. We all must. Thank you very much. A fine place, uh, Dr. Constance Ikoku. Delighted to be here. Well, that's it for this edition of Arise Prime Time. Do join us again uh, tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. It's goodbye and many thanks for watching.